video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one website building platform to bring your business to life and succeed online, all in one place and all on your terms. Earlier this year, I released a video on the artwork of Remedius Varro, an artist renowned for her mystical and otherworldly surrealist art that she produced during the early to mid 20th century. Born in Spain and enduring many hardships within Europe, brought on by war and poverty, she eventually fled Europe to seek refuge in Mexico, where her art truly began to flourish. However, she would not be the only artist within the surrealist movement of the 1930s who would seek asylum in Mexico. In fact, the artist we'll be looking at today not only shares a relatively similar background to Varro, but many have considered her style of art to be strikingly similar as well. The artist I'm referring to is Leonora Carrington, a British-born surrealist painter and novelist who today is still regarded as one of the leading influences during this crucial movement in art history. Her work is famous and recognisable for being both dreamlike and mysterious, often featuring fantastical creatures and surreal landscapes, often inspired by the fears, anxieties and nightmares she experienced during her youth whilst growing up in a neo-gothic mansion in Lancashire, England. She also wrote several novels and short stories, which explore themes of identity and the power of the subconscious. Some of you out there have requested that I cover Leonora Carrington for a while now, so I thought I'd make my last video of the year based on her magical and strange artwork. In this video, we're going to be briefly exploring the life and story of Carrington, as well as taking a good look at some of her most noteworthy masterpieces. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to see more videos from me on the weird and wonderful side of the art world. And with that said, welcome to another video everyone and welcome to the wonderfully strange art of Leonora Carrington. Mary Leonora Carrington was born at Westwood House in Clayton Green in Lancashire, England on April 6th, 1917. She was a daughter of a wealthy textile industrialist, and her upbringing was marked by a blend of privilege and conventionality. Her family were Roman Catholic and incredibly strict. Often she was privately educated by various governesses, tutors, and nuns, growing up in a grand Gothic revival mansion in Cockerham named Crookie Hall, a place that would greatly influence her imagination and creative style in her later artworks. However, from an early age, Carrington exhibited a rebellious and imaginative spirit that would shape her life and artistic career. In her youth, Carrington defied societal expectations for young women of her social class. She rejected formal education and instead pursued art, enrolling at the Chelsea School of Art in London. There she became friends with fellow surrealist Max Ernst, who would later become her lover and greatly influence her artistic development. However, after they had moved to France, the outbreak of World War II disrupted their relationship, as Ernst was German and deemed by the French authorities to be, quote, a hostile alien, and so he was quickly arrested only to be arrested again later by the Gestapo when Germany invaded France, because his art was considered by the Nazis to be, quote, degenerate. After that, despite Carrington suffering from terrible heartbreak and a mental breakdown from their forced separation, she and Ernst never continued their relationship in the decades that followed his release from prison. Fleeing the war and the restrictive environment of her family, Carrington moved to New York City in 1940. In the United States, she became part of a vibrant surrealist community and continued to develop her unique artistic style. Carrington's paintings often featured mythical and fantastical elements, drawing inspiration from her interest in mythology, alchemy, and the occult. After the war, Carrington settled in Mexico, where she would spend the majority of her life Mexico became a profound influence on her work, and she integrated local folklore and indigenous themes into her art. 
Her paintings are characterized by elusive landscapes, mythical creatures, and symbolic imagery. Apart from her contributions to the visual arts, Leonora Carrington was a talented writer, and her writing, much like her paintings, delved into the surreal, and she often explored themes of transformation, identity, and the mystical. Leonora Carrington's legacy as a surrealist artist and writer has gained increasing recognition over the years. Her work has been exhibited internationally, and she is celebrated for her role in challenging the conventions of both society and the art world. Carrington's life and art continue to inspire those who appreciate the power of imagination and the freedom to express oneself beyond societal constraints. She passed away on May 25, 2011, leaving behind a rich body of work that continues to captivate audiences and influence contemporary artists. One iconic painting of Carrington's that always seems to come to my mind is named The Meal of Lord Candlestick, completed in 1938. This bizarre scene, with an equally bizarre title, is a painting that explores themes of rebellion, subversion, and the height of Carrington's extraordinary imagination. It depicts a chaotic and somewhat grotesque scene of a family of female creatures gathered around a dining table, engaged in an unsettling, ritualistic-looking feast. Carrington's use of symbolism, distorted figures, and a dreamlike atmosphere creates a powerful and evocative commentary on the oppressive forces of conformity and the raw desire to break free from some kind of societal prison that she often found herself in. The painting's title, The Meal of Lord Candlestick, is a direct reference to Carrington's father, whom she nicknamed Lord Candlestick, due to his overbearing and controlling nature. Considering that Carrington completed this painting shortly after she left England, and during the beginning of her affair with Max Ernst, it's widely believed that this painting serves as a sort of mockery and rejection of a strict Catholic upbringing. The Dining Table a representation of the one used at the Great Banquet Hall in her parents' estate of Crookie Hall is transformed into an altar upon which a macabre feast is being consumed. The figures gathered around the table are distorted, with phallic necks and contorted faces. The food itself ranges from strange to straight-up repulsive, consisting of mostly live animals, and what even appears to be an infant that the figure at the head of a table is about to devour. Carrington's use of colour and texture further enhances the painting's unsettling atmosphere. The stark contrast between the dark and oppressive colours and the bright, garish colours of the objects creates a scene of disorientation and unease. This painting is currently in a private collection, and there's very little additional information surrounding the symbolisms included in this painting, despite there being many to choose from in this piece. But it seems clear that given what is documented, what we know of Carrington's childhood, and given the time period in which it was completed in, that this painting represents a sort of emotional closure to our upbringing, and a subsequent escape from it. There's a high possibility the child being consumed on the table could be a representation of herself. Someone who feels small, innocent, and helpless in the midst of a chaotic and dismissive family that only seems to take from her. Next, we have Leonora Carrington's portrait of Max Ernst. Painted in 1939, the portrait captures the essence of Carrington's relationship with the fellow surrealist artist, while simultaneously transcending the boundaries of conventional portraiture. The painting exudes an otherworldly atmosphere, with Ernst depicted as a commanding, towering figure, placed against a backdrop of a cold, mountainous, and alien-looking landscape a world which could be symbolic of the feelings Carrington experienced while living with Ernst in occupied France. Ernst is wearing a woolly, feather-like red gown that trails down to the shape of a fish-like tail, 
where we can also see on his exposed leg and foot a yellow and green striped stocking or sock. If you look closely at the lantern he's holding, it appears to contain a horse inside, and in the background behind him, we're presented with another horse frozen in ice. A horse is not an unusual sight in Carrington's paintings. Often she incorporated a white horse into her compositions as a surrogate for herself. But again, Carrington leaves the context of the horses in his painting deliberately ambiguous. Perhaps the horse could be guiding Ernst forward, acting as a protective guardian, or given the fact that both horses, one locked in a glass lantern and the other entombed in ice, could be a representation of Carrington's desire to break free, as it's been documented that their relationship was at times wild and unpredictable, with Ernst often playing the role of a dominating artistic mentor as well as her lover, someone who Carrington felt utterly dependent on. Perhaps this symbolism of that desire to break free could be a hint of her wanting to escape that dynamic of emotional and artistic control. According to an article by the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art, where this painting currently resides, quote, The painting captures some of the ambivalence in their relationship at the time. The outbreak of the Second World War effectively brought their relationship to an end. Ernst, who was German, was imprisoned first by the French as an enemy alien, and subsequently by the Gestapo. Carrington fled France for Spain, where she was hospitalized, having experienced acute mental stress. Eventually, both escaped to New York, where they exchanged portraits of each other, with Carrington presenting this work to Ernst. End quote. This painting, completed in 1946, is called The Kitchen Garden on the Eight. Created during Carrington's time in Mexico City, the work reflects the artist's immersion in rich folklore, spirituality, and mythology that became a predominant focus in many of her works from this period onwards. The painting's central focus that the painting is named after, this time is actually in the background, where we can see the walled kitchen garden where fruits, vegetables, and herbs are grown. Carrington, who was pregnant with her son at the time of painting this, uses this garden as a metaphor for procreation. The strange tree with a ghostly figure emerging from it on the right can be seen holding an egg, a mystical symbol of fertility that draws us into this garden as a space of biological and artistic conception. If you look around for long enough in this painting, you'll in fact notice other examples of these egg symbolisms, like a bird that lays its eggs in the hedge of a kitchen garden, which even in itself kind of looks like the shape of an egg. According to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, quote, The many eggs in the kitchen garden on the eight guide the viewer into this garden. The white figure points to the garden with her foot, the orange figure points with his raised hand, and the bird gestures towards the central opening with its wing. Suddenly, what previously appeared as an empty space is full of symbolic vibration. Carrington also superimposes two other symbols onto this area to multiply its significance. The walled garden, an emblem of a female body, and the six-pointed star, here represented by the six paths that converge at the center which signifies the supreme balance of elements required in acts of transformation. The garden therefore brings together fertility and creativity at a moment when the artist embodied both." End quote. To add another, well, egg fact, I guess we'll call it, Carrington also adopted the egg tempera medium, used in much early Christian iconography which is perhaps why this painting seems to radiate a lot of similarities to that of a Hieronymus Bosch painting. There are other symbolic figures that can be seen, such as a horned figure in red robes resembling the Celtic god Ker Nunos, who mingles with fellow spirits. This again could be a callback to Carrington's upbringing in Northern England during the 1920s, where at times she was steeped in Celtic myths told by her nanny and her Irish grandmother. As Carrington later recalled, 
quote, I had very strange experiences with all kinds of ghosts and visions and things, end quote. In many ways, it seems her paintings offered a sanctuary for the supernatural fantasies and personal experiences to come to life. When Carrington found her new home in Mexico during the time she painted this, she found other surrealists who encouraged her interests in the spiritual and more mystical side of life, including the painter Remedios Faro and the photographer Katie Horner. Together, they experimented with alchemy and explored many mythologies. In fact, the three figures on the left could be interpreted as Carrington, Varro, and Horner convening in their spiritual sanctuary, whilst the orange figure on the right sprinkles a substance that recalls the spell casting powders that they purchased in Mexican markets. Not only does this kitchen garden on the 8th stand as a testament to Leonora Carrington's unique and visionary artistic style, but it also subtly celebrates women and their bodies as agents of creating life, a celebration sadly at odds with the prevailing tendencies of surrealists. As Carrington explains, quote, the women surrealists were considered secondary to the male surrealists. They only wanted to entertain them as muses, mad or sensuous, end quote. However, here, Carrington inverts this role, her garden is walled off from the external influences as an independent space of creative action. Also, the fact that this garden, as the title suggests, is on an eight, meaning an island on a river, supports this theory twofold as a world that's entirely her own, one that's protected, isolated, safe, and harmonious. Carrington's The Giantess, or The Guardian of the Egg, completed in 1947, is a striking and enigmatic painting that reflects the artist's fascination with the subconscious, her dreams, and the fantastical, as well as being one of Carrington's most famous paintings. The painting features a colossal female figure, The Giantess, who is both formidable and ethereal, with an elongated body and a commanding presence. She wears a red dress beneath a white cape. Through the opening of her cape are depictions of strange bird-headed people and a three-headed bird in a register of scenes on the front of a dress. Her eyes, gazing over the strange landscape and animals around her, captures the viewer's attention, suggesting a sense of power and watchfulness. The egg, which serves as a central motif, is cradled in the giantess's hands. Similar to the kitchen garden, it is often considered to be symbolizing fertility, creation, and the potential for new beginnings. Behind her appears to be a vast ocean of creatures and activity, which beautifully blends with the sky of dark clouds above, and clashes with Carrington's use of muted and earthy tones for the ground below, enhancing the dreamlike quality of the scene, creating a mood that is both haunting and enchanting. One interpretation of the giantess revolves around the theme of feminine power and the nurturing aspect of creation. The giantess, as the guardian of the egg, embodies the primal force of creation and the cyclical nature of life. The egg, a potent symbol in many cultures, can represent birth, transformation, and the potential for regeneration. But there is also another interesting take from the egg motif used so often in her art that I've not yet mentioned, which can be unearthed from Carrington's book called Down Below, that recalls her memoirs from her time spent in a mental institution in Spain during the year of 1940. As Carrington describes, quote, This morning, the idea of the egg came into my mind, and I thought that I could use it as a crystal to look at Madrid in those days of July and August 1940. For why should it not enclose my own experiences as well as the past and future history of the universe? The egg is a macrocosm and the microcosm, the dividing line between the big and small, which makes it impossible to see the whole." End quote. The Surrealist movement often sought to explore the unconscious mind, and the giantess is no exception. 
The painting can be seen as a visual manifestation of Carrington's exploration of her own psyche and the collective human experience. The giantess may symbolize the artist's inner self, acting as a guardian and protector of the creative spark within her. As we already know, Carrington was heavily influenced by mythology and folklore. The giantess in the painting could be seen as a mythical figure, reminiscent of an ancient goddess or primordial being associated with creation and the mysteries of life. The surrealistic elements in the composition amplify the dreamlike quality, inviting viewers to contemplate the symbolic meanings behind the imagery. It is a truly captivating work that invites viewers to delve into the realms of the subconscious and the mystical. Through its mysterious symbolism, dreamlike atmosphere, and exploration of femininity and creation, the painting stands as a testament to Carrington's artistic vision and her contribution to the rich tapestry of surrealist art. Finally, I'd like to explore with you one of her works she created towards the tail end of her career, titled Bird Bath, completed in 1974. This period of her life is when Carrington began to add portrayals of older women to her visual vocabulary of repeated settings and figures. Such as these two elderly female figures dressed all in black, as Carrington herself dressed in her older age, who appear to be spraying white paint onto a red, duck-like bird. In the background, the familiar structure in the distance recalls her childhood home, Crookie Hall, which was decorated with ornamental bird motifs. According to theartstory.org, the use of a large basin of water and a clean white cloth held by the masked assistant recalls the Christian sacrament of baptism, and turning the bird white may allude to the symbolic dove of the Holy Spirit. However, the ceremony enacted by these characters seems humorous as well as solemn. Much like Carrington at this stage in her life, the women in the scene have undergone their own transformation, from young to old, while retaining creative power. It's also believed once again that the surreal ritual on display is another callback to Carrington's descriptions of her experiences in the Spanish Mental Asylum of 1940. There is something unpleasantly destructive in the nature of these two figures in the foreground, as if they have taken the bird against its will and subjected it to their own devices, removing its original colour of red, a colour that's often used in art to symbolise passion and energy, to be replaced by something blank, colourless, and plain such as white. Although this is just a personal theory, it's possible this could represent the suppression of Carrington's creativity and her sense of identity during her time of hospitalization. It's likely many workers at the institution saw her vivid imagination as a detriment rather than a place of solace for her mental health. Perhaps even something demonic, something that was seen to be removed or replaced instead of encouraged. Like I said, this is just a personal theory, but that's what I tend to love the most about Leonora Carrington's artwork. Although she has written about her life plenty of times, when it comes to her paintings, she shows much but explains very little, leaving it to us, the viewers, to come to our own conclusions and put the pieces together ourselves. As well as being a resilient female icon within the surrealist art movement that for a while was largely male-dominated, Carrington's unconventional life, artistic talent, and rebellious spirit have left an indelible mark on the art world. Carrington's ability to seamlessly blend reality with fantasy, drawing from mythology, folklore, and personal experiences, showcases her unique vision and contribution to surrealist art. When exploring her work, it becomes evident that Carrington's art transcends time, continuing to captivate, inspire, and challenge conventional norms, beckoning us not to be afraid of our sometimes overactive imaginations, but instead to embrace them like a lifelong friend. Proving that the mind at times can be a terrible ruler over us, but when used for creativity, 
it can be a truly wonderful ally. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. We are so close to kickstarting the new year now, but now that a new beginning is near, it's time to give ourselves some new goals, such as trying out a new medium, checking out an exhibition of an artist we've not heard of before, or if you're an artist, how about making a website for your art? Because Squarespace makes it super easy for beginners like you and me. From the get-go, you can choose from an endless catalogue of templates so you can easily tweak and edit to fit your own style. Whether your theme is bright and colourful, or dark and moody, Squarespace has you covered to meet your aesthetic. On top of that, the website building system is so simple and intuitive with their Fluid Engine technology. When editing your template and layouts, you can customize every design detail with Reimagine's drag and drop technology for desktop or mobile. And when it comes to showing off your artwork, using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs allows you to display your creations in the most professional way possible. In customizable galleries that can even include password protected pages to share private work with clients. So if you want to take the next step with your art career and create a new online home for your art, I highly recommend getting started with Squarespace and taking full advantage of the offer they're giving just for you guys. Just click the link in my description below and use the code on screen to get 10% off your first purchase and start your online presence in the best way possible. Thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. And of course, thank you to you for watching. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any theories of your own for Leonora Carrington's artwork in this video, or if you want to point out anything I might have missed, please let me know in the comments below. Before I go, it's time for me to share some artwork sent in by one of my viewers for my end of video segment, Artist Corner. And today's featured artist, who I thought would be very appropriate for today's video, is Tino Rodriguez. Tino tells me his work is inspired by dreams and their mysterious messages as he describes them. He's also fascinated in world mythology, fairy tales, poetry and music. Sometimes his artwork can even be inspired by the name of a song. For example, a song by the Cocteau Twins titled How to Bring a Blush to the Snow was the inspiration behind his imagery of the snow goddesses. Tino tells me he's also inspired by cave paintings and illuminated manuscripts, and of course, surrealism, especially by artists like Remedios Faro, and, as you might have guessed, Leonora Carrington. And I have to say, when looking through his work, Tino's style shares very similar qualities to both of these artists. But he also says he adores René Magritte and Max Ernst as well. Another thing that inspires Tino's art is traveling and languages. He tells me he speaks three languages and loves literature from many different cultures. He's also in love with nature and animals, particularly insects and flowers, for their potential for symbolism. Which leads us to his unique and eye-catching skull paintings. Tino says his skull series is inspired by his Mexican heritage, as well as the sacred ritual and celebration of death. From growing up eating sugar skulls with his name engraved on them led him to not have a fear of death, but more of a fascination in it. Quote, It's a mystery what happens after death, but definitely not scary or sad. Maybe melancholic, but never sad. Also, of course, these skulls are very inspired by the 16th century painter Archimboldo. All my work is painted by hand, and I use oils, watercolors, and gouache." End quote. I think Tino's work is not only beautifully detailed and elaborate, but also extremely thought-provoking. The kind of mind-bending imagery he presents is so magnetic and hypnotizing, just as surreal art should be. I can't help but get lost in the colors and creatures he designs, making it a joy to spot the symbolisms and metaphors hidden throughout each piece. His skull series in particular is very intriguing, and so clever how he uses the shapes of different animals and objects to transform them into different sections of a skull. That takes a particularly keen eye and vivid imagination to pull off. If you could spare yourself a few minutes to get lost in his artwork for yourself sometime, I seriously couldn't recommend him enough. Please head over to his Instagram page via the link you see on screen, or click the link in the below description. If you too are an artist and would like a chance to maybe feature on my channel someday, I'd love to meet you. 
please email me your artwork and a bit about yourself to blindweller at gmail.com or feel free to reach out to me on Instagram. Finally, as always, a huge never-ending thank you to all of my patrons and channel members. Here's a special shout out to all of my top tier donors within the Dweller family. Miles Zhang, Grape, who are both new patrons, so a big welcome to you two. Vlad Siv, Tyler Butler, Harley Raven, Eric Lamarca, Dave MC, Molotail, E. Quatermark, Lee Flowers, Calvin Kai, The New One Gone 24, Akaiza, Large Fatty or Big Chad, Charlie Sanchezi, Port Perea, Ken B, and Carol H. That's all for me today then, my friends. Hope you all had a lovely Christmas, and here's to an amazing new year. Keeping creative. Bye for now.